clear. Before I, uh, I turn the floor to uh, our speaker, let uh, me uh, present them. Jonathan Mina has been teaching in the Department of uh, Humanities at College La Salle since 2007. He holds an Emmy in English Literature from Dalhousie University and an, uh, and an honors BE in Liberal Arts and English Literature from Concordia University. Pascal, Pascal Warmos, has been teaching in the Department of Special Care Counseling at College La Salle since 2008. She holds an ME certificate in education from the University of Sherbrooke and a BA specialization in psychology. The passion and uh, the, the interest uh, in, explore, in exploring new and innovative pedagogical uh, approaches in their classroom and their interest for technology had led Pascal and Jonathan uh, to uh, to receive the College La Salle Teaching Excellence Award in 2018, the Southeast Research Mini Grant in 2017 for the implementation of smart pens in the classroom, and the Southeast Research Grant in 2018 for the implementation of VR in the classroom. In uh, 2020, they uh, were awarded the, 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 the PREP research grant by the Quebec Ministry of Higher Learning to undertake a research on the implementation of video games in the college classroom, which was published in June 2022. So have a good webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, your sound, Jonathan, you have to put your sound. Okay, so I'm yeah. going to start the, um, the PowerPoint. I'll show my screen, but just really quickly, uh, yeah, we could maybe skip a few uh, things because yeah. you presented us really well. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so, we so we'll save skip. time there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so share, hang on. I want to make sure, oh, wait, I'm going to stop oh. sharing because I didn't oh. do the same thing. Okay. Uh, share, <laughs> share sound. We saw your, your outlook. Oh, God, no, see don't outlook. see that. That's horrible. Okay, no. all right. Um, there we go. Okay. Good. Okay, we can get okay. started. Okay. So, uh, welcome to our presentation entitled Video Games Engagement Empathy in uh, the uh, <laughs> Empathy and Meaningful Learning uh, in the College uh, Classroom. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to we'd like to thank uh, certain institutions that have helped us through this uh, this long journey. So we'd like to thank uh, l'Association des Collèges Privés du Québec, ARC, the uh, Association pour la Recherche uh, au Collégial. They supported us quite tremendously. Uh, the Centre de Documentation Collégiale, the Ministère de l'Éducation, Ministère de l'Enseignement Supérieur, the AQPC for permitting us to do this uh, nice uh, presentation. And most importantly, our home, our institution, uh, Collège La Salle. Okay. Uh, so uh, just uh, the content of uh, this presentation, what we will be covering uh, will be, well, we're gonna skip the welcoming presentations. Uh, yeah. It was done yeah. very nicely by uh, Nicole, uh, but we will uh, talk about what motivated us to uh, use video games in the classroom. Afterwards, mm -hmm. we will present our research project uh, what we did exactly. And then uh, at point four, number four, we will discuss uh, the guide for teachers that we created because oftentimes we went and we uh, did these uh, presentations and teachers often said, this is really nice that you're implementing video games and all that, but how do we as teachers do this if we don't know nothing about it, right? So we created a guide for uh, teachers. So we'll be looking at that towards the end. Okay. Yeah. No um, need. Yeah, no <laughs> need to there. do that. Yeah, it's no. all there. Okay. Okay. Context. All right. So yeah. So why did we embark on this project uh, in this research in the first place? Um, we've been sort of looking at this from 2012, but initially the sort of the goal of of all our sort of interest in this was really on our, the top of my mind was the retention rate in students uh, or in CJ in student 
CGIP students, basically. Um, the retention rate, so a lot of people would drop out and they wouldn't complete their studies. In fact, uh, you know, since 2008, only 63% at that time would actually graduate and finish their programs. Um, and when you actually divide it into like the two genders, male and female, you have male students who are only graduating at 56% um, and 67% of female students. So this is quite low. And it's so preoccupying for the Ministry of Education that Daniel McCann, um, a few years ago, well, I guess two years ago now, uh, set a goal, an, an actual objective, a primary objective for the Ministry of Education to increase the uh, rate to at least 64 to 68%. Um, now, retention rate is an issue, obviously, at the ministerial level, but it's also an issue for me and Pascal as a teacher um, or teachers, uh, because we want to sort of find a way to make students engaged with the material, like we want them to get uh, them to enjoy their experience so that they're just more likely to stay, you know, uh, in their program and actually complete it, right? So we want to create some motivation there, some engagement there. Another preoccupying uh, issue that really inspired us was the growing popularity of video games. Um, it's really outstanding the number of people that play uh, in Canada. Uh, in fact, according to the Entertainment Software Association of Canada, we have 23 million players in Canada. That's 61% of the Canadian population. Um, and when you look at the age group from 6 to 17, that's 89% of Canadian teens and kids that, that play video games. So there's a very good chance that our students in our classrooms are playing video games, even the older students. Um, the average age is 34 years old. Um, so that's a pretty interesting statistic. And uh, for a while now, for a number of years, it's 50% female, 50% male uh, players. So clearly video games are a growing uh, market um, and something that uh, is used as a popular pastime in our students. Um, during the pandemic, uh, another interesting thing was that more people were playing games. Uh, so like more adults were playing more games, 58%, and teenagers was 80%. And here's the really interesting thing. Um, they said adults, 65% said that they actually, video games kind of helped them cope through the pandemic and the lockdowns and all that. And when you look at teens, 78% said that. So there's there's something really good in, in, in this, you know, uh, form of entertainment. It, it helped them psychologically get them some support, right? So if you want to know the type of games, uh, the report is online, but here are the type of games that they were playing. Um, but essentially, this kind of gave us the idea that you know, okay, you know, so we got these video games, can we integrate these video games in our CGIP courses and um, use them as tools, kind of like movies or textbooks in, in the same way. So we don't, we're not looking at like, you know, giving the video game and disappearing from the class, we're really looking at video games as a support tool, as a way, just another material and assistant that helps us engage our students and, and make them learn certain concepts. And so in order to explore this, you know, we said, okay, we're going to go and do this, but we have to absolutely look at what the research says. So we have to do a literature review. And when we did our literature review, here's what we found. So uh, the key findings uh, that we found was that there was a general positive correlation between learning and the usage of video games when we're looking at serious games. Uh, serious games, video games, they create feelings or perceptions of uh, learning, engagement, immersion, immersion, challenge in students, okay, which this opens up learning opportunities in students. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, uh, another thing uh, that we found in, uh, in research was ETI that uh, said that vi video games are not a good replacement for class lectures by teachers and re weaker results and, uh, and results in weaker uh, academic performance. So yeah, so you cannot be taking some kind of, you know, medium tool such as video games and replacing it with a teacher. And that's pretty obvious, right? Because when we uh, teach, uh, we often, you know, are there to support and guide our students in the specific types of material that we want them to be using. Uh, the limitations, uh, current research uh, does not document strategies that teachers can use to implement video, video games in their classroom. So there's nothing on that, okay? How does a teacher go about, you know, implementing uh, these uh, video games in his classroom? You know, a teacher that knows absolutely nothing about it. Uh, most research uh, focuses on general 
learning outcomes in primary and high school. So just basically, you know, on perception, you know, like the students that play more have better perception skills, but it doesn't look at, you know, a teacher with, with you know, trying to look at their, um, their objectives that they want to attain in the course and how they can match that with a video game. Uh, most uh, research focuses exclusively on the use of educational video game in their research, so serious games. They're not looking at entertainment-based video games. So in the next slide, Jonathan's going to kind of uh, elaborate on those two differences and explain how what we did. All right. In terms of so yeah, so Pascal mentioned you know um, the difference between educational games and serious games. So I want to sort of break that down with you, but keep in mind that our you know, separation is not something that is like locked in stone. There is yeah. going to be exceptions, yeah. but it's just to get you an idea of what we're like, which direction we're going into. So you got a definitions. Okay, so what is an educational video game? Uh, in a nutshell, the way we sort of conceptualize it was that, you know, these are games done by researchers and teachers, and they have this concept that they want to teach, whether it's protein folding or vocabulary, whatever, and then they sort of wrap around the game around it to gamify it, to make it more interesting. Um, and those are really good. And the research does show that some of these games, well, quite a lot of these games actually do work. They do lead to learning. But very little focus in the research community uh, focuses on entertainment based games. So what are entertainment based games? Entertainment based games are games that are created by the industry. Uh, they're done by professionals, very polished experiences, millions and millions of dollars are spent on them. And so their primary focus is, of course, entertainment. And what we want to do is we want to say, okay, these experiences are obviously engaging, they're motivating, like you want to play them. Uh, can we bring those games into our classroom? And do they provide the same opportunities for learning as serious games can, as the research has shown? So that's kind of where we're coming from. So we're, you know, trying to see this, right? And of course, as teaching aids. Now, um, there is a really, really big company uh, from France, but they have a big headquarters here in, in, in Montreal called Ubisoft. They're responsible for doing a very popular series called Assassin's Creed. And if you don't know the franchise, it's a game where they study the history of uh, civilization. So for instance, they would study like ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, and they really take the time to look at the architecture, the culture, the religion, and they really try to recreate it uh, in their virtual, like virtual game, their virtual world. And unfortunately, the game is very violent and there's missions and it doesn't really fit in reality. Um, but the architecture, everything else is real. So what they did is they actually started to create this mode uh, called Discovery Tours, where you, you know, they took away all the violence and all you do is you, you just walk around on these tours and you learn about certain things like religion, culture, and so on. So you have Ubisoft, a company that is absolutely invested in entertainment, and they're trying to bridge the gap as well and taking those materials and trying to put them into an educational space. And some high school teachers are actually using them. Uh, I want to show you a trailer of what that looks like. Now, we didn't use this game, but it's just to tell you that there's a lot of potential to look into this, right? Um, and that's where our research kind of situates itself in. So here's the trailer. Um, it is a really compelling experience, I must say. Um, To create the Discovery Tour in ancient Greece was a no-brainer for us. It's a crossing between the worlds of museums, the world of archaeology, and the world of video game. Discovery Tour's immersion and being in the uh, game world itself is just a very unique experience that you can't get through other mediums. The whole world is open to you. So the Discovery Tour Ancient Greece is actually the second opus of that new franchise. It's a result of game developers wanting to reuse the worlds of Assassin's Creed to create a second tool really meant for people to learn through the fun medium of a video game. First Discovery Tour was a dream for us, it was great, but we wanted to do more. We wanted to improve the experience and we wanted to be more accessible to more people. So we have five different teams that really will help you to understand the time period of antiquity. Like famous cities, daily life, battles and wars, politics and philosophy, and also art, religion and myths. In order to make uh, the Discovery Tour accessible to more people, uh, we've changed a little bit the experience. 
We still kept the tours that are really the core experience of the Discovery Tour. They are accessible from the start, you can play them, you can interact with them, but then we're going deeper into the experience. We have the Discovery sites, and they're really just kind of standalone spots all over the world that have different interests. Some of them are on really tall mountains, some of them are under the water. So you really got to explore to find them all, which is a new kind of interaction that we brought. When you're discovering sites, when you're interacting with tours, you're actually receiving rewards. These rewards are mounts that you can travel with or uh, avatars that you can play with. There's also uh, the tour guides that have a more human sense to the interaction that you have with the tours and especially with the quizzes at the end that are very lighthearted and fun. Sometimes people can be intimidated by quizzes, but we're not there to give you a grade. These are not mandatory, but they're super fun, and they really enhance your learning experience. Even if we're not a player and we don't have really a talent in games, we're capable to discover things in a very simple way. It's very intuitive, very instructive. It's also really a dimension that's interesting that we wouldn't see in other media in general. We are at the crossing of a video game and a science product. So really it was important for us to bring the good aspects of video games into the Discovery Tour, but also to get feedback and do research from the academic side. Le jeu éducatif, c'est vraiment un outil innovateur. À une certaine époque, on enseignait avec le cinéma, on le fait encore, on enseignait avec les romans, on le fait encore, avec le théâtre, peu importe. Mais c'est un outil supplémentaire qui vient se greffer à toutes les possibilités que l'enseignant euh, peut utiliser dans sa pratique. I think learning is a lot about agency. As soon as someone tells you you have to learn something, there's some of the fun taken away from it. So if we look at learning as play and as exploring, exactly. we need to make sure that players can focus on what's interesting to them and then they'll naturally get more curious. Ten years ago, I was dreaming of building something like the Discovery Tour. And now I see that we have a product that is in front of the line. There's nothing like it on the market. I hope people will learn about ancient Greece, whatever most fascinates them, because there's so many different things you can pull away from the game with. I hope everyone finds something that resonates with them. So, uh, I mean, you get the idea, right? So this was just for the ancient Greece one. There's uh, one from Egypt and one from uh, the Viking era as well. Um, but that's kind of the idea. So that was, you know, the context. This is kind of what motivated us. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our research project. Um, go ahead, Pascal. Yep. Okay. So, um, okay. So we had for our research project, we had two objectives. Um, the first one was to uh, see if the use of entertainment based video games as supportive material can lead to significant learning. And we uh, did this in a knowledge course. So it was in a humanities course that Jonathan taught. And we also did it in a special care counseling uh, course called Interactions and Cultural Communities. So we implemented two video games in there. We also wanted to uh, take note of, you know, uh, of you know the way we implemented uh, this video game and create a guide that would help teachers uh, implement this in the classroom. So we did two yeah. things there. Those were our two objectives. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so to do this. Yeah, uh, there were yeah. two experiments. So the first one yeah. was yours. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, we'll talk about it, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so to do this, we, we had two experiments uh, that we designed and this was done on purpose because uh, we wanted to get away. So like for a number of years, I've been experimenting in Pascal too, since 2012 actually, with video games in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And for a number of years, they're like, well, this, this would work in your discipline, but it will never work in my discipline. So we wanted to have a multidisciplinary approach to our research. So experiment one really focused on humanities and it focused on a game called Portal, uh, which is a pretty old game, 2007 it came out. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to get my, my participants, so my students essentially, to play this game. And then I would try to document, uh, well, I'd split it up into two groups, a pre-test group and a post-test group. And I would see if there's a difference in the ability to think critically between the group that didn't play the game versus the group that did play the game. Uh, so where there are changes in critical thinking skills. And how I defined critical thinking skills was very specific. It was using something called Bloom's uh, revised taxonomy, um, which I, I'll show you a little bit what that is. It's like a pyramid. The higher you go, the harder the skill is, right? Um, so that's what we did. Experiment two, yeah. So for experiment two, it was uh, in the special care counseling program. Uh, I used the, the game Never Alone. So what I wanted to do there, I wanted to measure the changes in empathy level of students uh, towards the Inuit culture and community. Uh, our theoretical framework was uh, based on Carl Rogers' empathetic listening skills. 
but we wanted to see once they play this video game, are they going to refer a lot more to the, the Inuit culture values and belief systems? Okay, so we're going to show you again some movie watching. Break out the popcorn. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to show you what <laughs> what what the game looks like a little bit. Okay, so you're going to see it's fairly complex, my game, uh, and it'll explain the story and how it fits in my class. It, what's the context of all this, right? Like, you know, why am I doing this, right? But I just want to, you to see the game, okay? Um, and uh, keep in mind, it's an old game, so uh, the graphics are a little old. Here. Welcome to the Aperture Science Enrichment Center. Let's look at some of the challenges you'll face as a test participant. You may be required to perform simple tasks, such as locating an exit. These simple tasks may be supplemented with insurmountable obstacles. Thanks to the Aperture Science handheld portal device, the impossible is easy. Let's look at a real-world example. Certain objects may be vital to your success. If at first you don't succeed, you fail, and the test will be terminated. Wensta, remember our motto, there's a hole in the sky through which things can fly. At the Enrichment Center, we believe that a highly motivated test subject can carry out rather complex tasks while enduring the most intense pain. So in case you don't make it through the testing, goodbye. This next test is impossible. Now you're thinking with portals. So it's fairly complicated. Welcome to the oh god, okay. It's fairly complicated. <laughs> okay. Um, so like, okay, so yeah, okay, Jonathan, you know, you put this in this class, congratulations, right? But what's the context, right? Like, why are you doing this? Um, as you mentioned, I teach humanities. If the for those who aren't familiar with the course, it's it's kind of like philo, philo one. Uh, basically, we're trying to think about uh, we're trying to get students to understand the importance of critical thinking and part of critical thinking is questioning your perceptions your beliefs and your knowledge right so what you're shown your beliefs are not really you know correct unless you question them and make sure they're correct right and that's when you will attain knowledge and to do this i traditionally asked them to read a story called allegory of the cave it's a really old story from ancient greece about these cave people that are stuck in a cave all they see is shadows and one day, one person, one prisoner is taken out of the cave and shown the real world. And at first, he finds it really difficult to accept that everything he was shown is a lie. But eventually, he accepts it. And then he tells his friends. He goes back to the cave and tries to tell his friends, please, please come out. You're living a lie. But they don't want to believe him. And so the whole idea is that you know, humans are kind of not really uh, they're not really encouraged to ask questions and to think critically, but it's really important. Otherwise, you're trapped forever in a cave, right, of, my, of your mind. Um, and, and so I get them to read that story, but they don't really quite understand it or they don't really see how useful it is. I feel that it is extremely useful in today's world and the media and so on and how it kind of manipulates us. So I said, you know what? Let's put the story aside. Let's get them to play this game. And that was the game Portal. So as you can see, it's a puzzle game, but what I'm really interested in is in the story. You see, the story is you wake up as a woman, suddenly in a bed, you don't know why you're there. And uh, there is very limited information. The only information you're given is a voice that speaks to you through speakers. 
And uh, it tells you you're safe here. Fun and learning is, is the primary objective. It's the voice you heard in the trailer. But as you play the game, and you have no choice but to believe it, of course, but as you play the game, you start to realize, hmm, that voice isn't really trying to help me. And this place isn't safe. And I need to find out what the heck is going on here, right? What's really going on? Um, and so as you play the game, you're kind of trying to peel away the, the lies to get at some kind of truth. So this is kind of my way of making them experience what it's like to be a prisoner in a cave, essentially, right? Or a prisoner in a lab and is trying to uncover the truth. What's really going on here? And in this way, I think that it can help them sort of realize just how fun critical thinking can be due and, and how useful as well it can be, right? Because they're not just thinking about the game. Um, we'll talk about this. Uh, oh yeah, well, I, we give them also discussion questions as they're playing the game. So, um, so as they're playing the game, they're also encouraged with prompts to think about like metaphors or symbols in their real life, you know, like think about branding, think about media, think about how we're constantly tricked as well into believing certain things that might not be true, but we think are true, you know. Um, and so as they're playing, and this is important, they do have to answer questions. I don't walk away and let them be, right? I use it as a support. I guide the experience. This is super important, okay? Pascal, your uh, trailer, let me show your yep. trailer. Okay. So this is what Pascal used. It's a much more fun and cute game. <laughs> well, it's fun, both. It's, cute. it's, it's just cute. cute. Yeah. That was the end. Okay. Yeah. So um, for my course, the learning uh, objective was uh, for them to understand the characteristics of people coming from the Inuit community and to be more empathetic towards them. So we do um, we do explore different communities, and this one was one of them that I struggled the most with, uh, since you know I didn't come from that community itself. So coming from a you know. Uh, colonization background, I found it difficult to teach it, to teach this content to my students. So the Never Alone was a really excellent game to implement in this classroom uh, because uh, the player comes to play the character Nuna, okay, who is seven years old, and she goes on an adventure to find the source of the blizzard so she, so she can save her community. So, you know, if there's a big blizzard, uh, she, uh, the, the people in her community cannot, you know, go go outside for wood or get food and etc. So, and as uh, the player plays that character, Nuna, they get to experience a really ancient story, okay, that is transmitted orally by the members of the Inupiat community. Just to say this story is 2,500 years old. And so they get to listen to this story, you know, while they're playing it, okay. And also it, it really makes them aware of the values, the tra traditions, uh, the beliefs, okay, the spiritual aspect and survival skills from this culture. So it's really, really nice to get that portrayal there. Also students are really, really immersed into uh, this culture. So it was a really nice uh, winning factor. 
Uh, also, as a student played uh, the game, they answered questions that focused on what I wanted them to learn. So I just, I, I didn't just, you know, throw them in there and told them, play the video game and just take what you want. I had specific questions that were geared towards my learning objectives. And we discussed them after. Yeah. So the the so our research, what we did exactly, yeah. Jonathan. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to give you a little bit of details. We're not going to dwell yeah. too much on this. That's you know that's going to be for like expa and, and stuff that's more science based. Uh, yeah. But we do need to talk to you about what this you know a little bit of the methodology yeah. here. Uh, um, so what we did is we had uh, thirty five participants um, in pre test post gifs group. So the pre test group did not play the game and they answered a questionnaire. And the post test group answered actually two questionnaires. One that was very same with the pretest, but the other one was just for them because it's really just about the video game. Um, and so we had two uh, questionnaires. Uh, psychometric questionnaire was trying to measure uh, their experience playing the game, how they felt, were they engaged, immersed, um, uh, you know, they, did they feel that they were learning, were they challenged, and so on. Um, it actually looked like this on the top right here, the top screen. Mm -hmm. So learning one and so on. Now, this is important. It was taken from a research uh, on serious games. And what that research said was that a games that had these things, uh, actually allowed for opportunities to learn. They led to learning to a certain extent. So it was important that we use this test because we wanted to verify that Portal actually was a good game, right, for us to use. Uh, we, uh, we needed some science to back it up. Um, and so that was really important. It was only for the post-test group because they're the only ones who played the game. Mm -hmm. The discussion questions questionnaire uh, was actually done by both groups, and this is where we would compare. This is where we're looking at, okay, if they are potentially learning something, what are they learning, right? And so because I wanted to measure critical thinking, um, what I did was I, I actually developed a, a series of seven questions. Each question would measure one aspect of Bloom's taxonomy, so remember, understand, apply, analyze, and so on. And then if the pretest group answered really well, questions one, two, three, but the post-test group did not answer three very well, then there's a difference and we need to explore that, right? So I would compare the pretest group and the post-test group. Um, if the post-test group answered 4A much better than the pretest group, that means that they can use apply and analyze better than the pretest group. So obviously there was some kind of impact uh, in terms of the experience of playing the game, being guided by my questions in the class, right? Um, and all that, that kind of had an impact on the critical thinking skills, okay? Um, Pascal, so that's what we did. Pascal, what did you do? Yeah, uh, so what I did is I also used, uh, like Jonathan, the psychometric uh, questionnaire uh, that was uh, rated in the post-test. We wanted to see if students had the feeling that they were learning, okay, that they were engaged, okay? So we wanted to look at that. So uh, Jonathan, I think you already showed this yep. uh, questionnaire. Yep. Uh, we yep. also, um, uh, and for my group, what we also did is we also looked at, we gave an interpersonal uh, reactivity index. And here what it does is, is it's a really known questionnaire in the, in the domain of psychology. And what it does is it rates the measure, the rate of um, the levels of empathy. So we gave this questionnaire to the pretest, the ones that hadn't played the video game. And we also gave it to the, uh, this questionnaire to the post-test, the ones that had played the video game. And there are different categories that they rate in terms of empathy. So we looked at that. And also uh, we, um, we also gave a questionnaire, uh, no, a lived, ex lived experience uh, questionnaire in the pretest and the post test. And we wanted to see if participants would be using more active listening skills, okay, and uh, apply uh, empathy. So basically, what we did is we created a, a lived experience a questionnaire. So it's the story of this 14 year old uh, girl called Alicia, and she's coming from the Inupiaq community, and she's just arrived in Montreal, and she's just started. Uh, high school. So it's her first day uh, at a high school. And you have the SEC that decides to meet with her for the first time. And now our instructions uh, to the students was for them to create a scenario. So we told them, create a full script, okay, that, you know, describes how this interaction would be. Uh, use your uh, helping relationship skills. So use your reflection skills, reformulation, door openers, etc. Uh, you know, and and uh, tell us how this interaction would be. Okay, so we gave it to the pretest, the ones that hadn't played the video game, and the post-test, the ones that had uh, played the video game. We wanted to see if they would make 
more references to mm -hmm. the Inupiaq community once they had played the video game, because this would demonstrate more empath empathy and perspective taking. Mm -hmm. So uh, the not to go into too much details, just the treatment, uh, the treatment and analysis uh, we used for our questionnaires, we used the methodologies, uh, we used the software RStudio, and uh, we also used for the qualitative uh, data, software QBA Marner uh, 6, for those that are interested. Uh, I know sometimes mm -hmm. there's some uh, viewers that want to know uh, what we did exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there you yeah. go. So what are the okay. results, Jonathan? Yeah, so let's talk about the results because we do want time for the guide. I think the yeah. guide is really going to, yeah. uh, hopefully it's going to help you guys. We really worked so hard on the guide. Yeah. Um, but what are the results? Uh, so really, really quickly without going into, again, details, we keep mentioning that. Um, but what the psychometric test showed was that, yes, Portal did have the elements that is consistent with, this, with the research on yeah. serious games and that it does offer learning opportunities. So it had... A, correlations, strong and moderate correlations with a few dimensions that were super important to lead to learning. And it's super consistent with Hamari and Al's research, which uh, looked at serious yeah. games. Um, in terms of the discussion questionnaire, uh, this was really interesting. Um, we hypothesized that there wouldn't be much of a difference between the first kind of few questions between the pretest and the post test. Um, but in fact, the post test answered the question. So the amount of words, so what we did is we categorized all the words and the amount of words that were on topic in the post test group were significantly higher in pretty much all questions. Um, and specifically, the questions that they really did well on was measuring the uh, apply skill mm -hmm. and the evaluate skill, which is really interesting yeah. for us. Because if we go back to um, the pyramid here, it's the middle and higher order. That's they're really the post test is performing well. Now, again, we don't know if it's just the game because that wasn't the objective of our test, but we certainly think that there's enough indication to suggest that the experience of playing the game in the classroom with the guidance, with their peers, all that contributed to uh, some kind of change in their critical thinking skills. Okay. And so conclusion, um, the game works. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it works. Um, so there are indicators, uh, yeah. critical yeah. thinking, yeah, there's indicators, there's yeah. indicators, right? Um, so that's, that's it. Go for it. Oh, okay. So for the results yeah. of uh, Never Alone for experimentation two, uh, you can advance the PowerPoint. Uh, so when we're looking at the, uh, the measures of empathy uh, in our participants, we noticed that there was an increase of 4.5% uh, in the post test. So they were uh, they were more empathic, okay, in the post-test versus the pre-test. So that's uh, pretty big, considering that it was a very, very uh, small uh, group that we had used our testing on. Uh, also, uh, as Jonathan uh, showed his, in terms of the psychometric uh, test, we saw that there were very strong correlations and moderate ones. So uh, students did have the perceptions and the feeling that they were uh, very much um, engaged uh, in learning and were uh, challenged and immersed. Uh, also for the lived experience questionnaire where uh, there was Alicia, um, when we're looking at, um, can you go back just a second? Sure, just, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, Sorry. no, you don't have to. But when we're looking at the comparisons of the pre and post tests of the SEC, uh, referring to values and belief systems of the Inupiaq community and looking at the pre and the post test of, uh, you know, the client discussing values and beliefs, uh, we saw that there was more, uh, more references used to, uh, to the Inuit community. So they were applying more empathy skills. So you can see it right down here in category two that, you know, they made more referrals to the, cult, the client's cultural background versus mm. the pretest. So the coding mm. was, was there. Yeah. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, you know, the tests show that uh, Never Alone has yep. uh, the, the elements to achieve learning, and there was an increase in empathy skill for experiment yep. two. Okay. So one, oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, okay. one last experiment we did. As you notice, we used the psychometric test for both experiments, and this is where the multidisciplinary aspect comes in. Uh, we wanted to actually find a way to mm -hmm. see if, if we can compare the two groups. So we did it. We asked the methodologist to do it. Yes, they were comparable. So we matched them up, and we wanted to see if the experience of playing games, regardless of the different games, the different classes, was it similar? And um, we found that there were strong or high correlations with almost every single dimension uh, when we matched the groups together. So so their experience resembled each other quite a bit, um, regardless of the difference in game, different discipline, and so on. So this kind of gives a little bit of an argument that says, well, you know, certain video games work only in, for certain disciplines. That, that might not be true. That might not actually be true. Um, so what are the conclusions? So uh, the conclusions is that um, it, cr it creates similar feelings of learning, and uh, both video games do that. Uh, the other thing is that despite you have very, despite that there are very different video games that are used in different disciplines, there's still, you know, learning that's occurring. So even though it's very different, you still have that learning experience going on. There's an increase in empathy and an increase in critical thinking. So in each mm -hmm. experimentation, you could see there's indicators there. There's something going yeah. on there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just for one comment from a student, because I think it's always important to get the student's uh, perspective on this. So uh, for the game Never Alone, one of them said, the game is interesting, especially the small documentaries. They help us focus on the more important ideas in the game. What I liked most was that is that I was completely immersed in the game. In terms of the values, we learn a lot. Cooperation and perseverance from the little girl is important. I never imagined that I could learn about another culture and its values through a video game, okay? Um, so it's it's really nice, uh, and I think that just to to finish off this one, uh, you know, the spiritual part of their beliefs is often hard to explain concretely. The video games offers another way to explain these ideas. Reading text is too long and complex. A video game allows you to learn about the First Nations in a new way that is fair or just to them because it's not yeah, coming it's from them. It's their story, no. right? It's not ours. So that that's that's really nice. Okay. Yeah. Guide. Okay. <laughs> oh, limitations. Yeah. yeah, just very quickly, limitations, because we do want to get to the guide, uh, and it's 46, but um, keep in mind that this was exploratory research, so it's not definitive. It's just that there was so little out there that looked at entertainment-based games in CGIP system, in college systems. Uh, what, it was just like there was almost nothing. So um, what we could have done was maybe, and we would love to do in the future, is to look at different programs and different disciplines, so expand things. Uh, and see if like other disciplines can use it in positive ways. Uh, we would have liked to look at the potential risks. We have to keep in mind that video games are also, they have other issues. They promote certain values that we might not consider are healthy, like addiction, mm -hmm. um, you know, other things like violence and so on. And we never really looked into that, uh, although there is a lot of literature about it. So we would, we could maybe look at that. Um, and the other one is we would like to explore different kinds of games as well, right? Serious games, there's serious games and, uh, and entertainment games, but there's so many different other kind of games out there as well, right? Uh, strategy games, na 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 na. So okay. that's the idea. Yeah. All right, so that's the research. We had like ten minutes to do yeah. the guide. Oh, guide. Um, okay. The guide. Uh, just quickly to tell you, um, we have prepared, so in our report, uh, so on prep, you can find it online, um, we can post a link, but in our report chapter, I believe it's 4.3, we created a guide. And so we're going to provide that guide for you, just the chapter, not the whole report, um, that you can access. And everything we talk about is literally explained in there. It's seven pages long, but there's a, a good questionnaire we created to help teachers kind of decide if games are uh, the game they choose is the right one okay um so if we go through this quickly don't worry you've got the guide and we can also be available for questions all right go on so uh pedagogical recommendations when you want to implement a video game in your classroom uh, it's very important to concentrate on precise learning objectives um use online resources when you're researching uh video games uh they must match your learning objectives uh, take time to play the video game by yourself. Ask is the video game. So is it a good choice? So there's certain criteria you can look at that can help you decide whether or not your video game is a good one. Okay. And so we created a questionnaire that can help you this, you know, navigate that. 
also uh, create discussion questions on specific ele elements you want uh, the students to learn about when they're playing uh, the video game. So while they're playing the video game, you should have a questionnaire there that they're filling out as they're going along. That can be very supportive in terms of what they need to tweak out in terms of information. Right, so we're gonna give you a little more details on each of these steps, okay? So first, concentrate yeah. on precise learning objectives. What do we mean? Um, yeah. I'll just give you a very quick example of what I did and what Pascal did, and you'll understand yeah. what this means, right? So I had a, a, an objective. My objective was I want them to appreciate uh, the idea of critical thinking, questioning your perceptions, uh, questioning your beliefs so that you attain knowledge, okay? I wanted them to understand allegory of the cave. That was a real goal of mine. And I said, well, they're not understanding it. So what do I want them to do? I want them to actually experience what it's like to be lied to all your life and then shown the truth. I want them to go through that process. Ah, Portal was a really good idea. Uh, and so, you know, I found that game just by chance. I was playing it on my own. And I was like, there's a lot of themes there. This is really interesting. And so I matched it, but I had a very clear goal in mind. In Pascal's case, what did you have? Yeah, in my case for the game Never Alone, I wanted my, uh, my students to, you know, understand a culture, its values, its belief systems, its traditions, and etc. And I, I wanted to take into consideration that, you know, I wasn't probably the best person to explain all of this since I didn't come from that culture. And when I fell on the game Never Alone, I said, oh, wow, this is, you know, their creation. This is their story. So I think this is going to bring it home and it's going to help them, you know, understand really what's going on there and, uh, and you know, understand their context. So, yeah. Uh, so also online resources. So, so that's the second step. So yeah, the what are online step. resources? Yeah, so you can, one online resource that we find uh, really, really interesting is uh, commonsensemedia.com. It's really interesting because what it does is it helps you select your game that you're looking for. So you can really, you know, uh, check off, you know, uh, the sections that really interest you. So if you want your game to be educational, uh, you can click on it if you want it to be on science, on art, on, you know, whatever you find interesting on thinking and reasoning. Well, you click all that and then it'll, you know, show you all the video games that exist. Now, one added factor that it has here is that it gives a review. So parents review it and teachers review it. They review the video game and they tell you what its benefits are and what's, what's its limits. It also tells you uh, in terms of, you know, is there too much violence in this video game? Is the language proper? You know, uh, are there good role models? Uh, you know, and uh, and etc. So it's really really nice way to assess and see if that is a good video game or not. Okay. Uh, there. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Sorry. Uh, also, you have the online um, resources as well. So those, you know, the where you you can buy your video games. So you've got platforms and stores. So one, uh, there are many of them, but one example that we put here was Steam that is very, very well known. And what you do is you just, you can type in your search, uh, your word search, and uh, it will bring you a list of games or you, there's a category and you just check, you know, the categories that you think would be most pertinent for your class. And then it, it comes up with all a list of video games. And what's nice about it is they have a little trailer showing you, you know, how it's played. Yeah. Next. Okay. Um, there's yeah, also then, like, yeah, yeah uh, online resources. Oh. Uh, so uh, another thing that I do is I actually read a lot of uh, sites that cover video games and video game culture in a nutshell. And it's really interesting because it's not just reviews. Like if you go to Kotaku or Game Informer, uh, these sites, um, sometimes they come with like yeah. some kind of uh, article about a game and how what it says about our community or mm -hmm. a certain topic. So like, for instance, tell me why I never really noticed this, but this was a, an adventure game where you choose, like you play a character in the life of a village and you're negotiating relationships and so on. And, you know, it has to do with gender and sexuality. And I thought that was really interesting. So if I were to teach a gender and sexuality course, that might be a really interesting game to take a look at. Now, I never heard of it prior to reading this article. So, mm -hmm. you know, you got you to gotta sort of immerse yourself a little bit more into what's going on. Um, okay. Uh, the next step is you play the video game yourself. Super important. Take notes. It's really important that you play the game because you need to experience it and you need to put yourself in the shoes of the students when you get them to play it. So you need to sort of understand what they're going to notice, what they're going to feel. And then you need to evaluate the five dimensions. Okay, so we've outlined this in the guide. We're going to go through them rather quickly, but mm -hmm. most of the stuff is from Gentile. 
Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, Gentile, do you want to do you want to take over, Pascal? <laughs> sorry. No, yeah, yeah. It's from Gentile. Yeah. So let's just go into the amount of playtime. So when you're okay. selecting your yeah. video game, your video game, it's important to see how long is the video game. So mine is about six hours to complete. Jonathan is around two, three hours. That's okay. It's pretty feasible. But if it's too long, then you might want to ask your students to take breaks, okay? Because yeah. it it could be unhealthy and lead to you know potential addictions and etc. Um, you know, look at the reward system. Okay, that's another thing. Okay, so if the reward systems are based on competence and skills, then that's a good thing. Okay, and uh, and go on, go on. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when we're looking at the co content of the game, and what is the story? So is the story about you know military people killing off other people? Well, there's not much content, but if the story has a lot of you know, content and themes and ideas that are that could be important. It's important to evaluate that. So, for example, mine, the story Never Alone, which is an oral story that depicts all the values, the belief systems, and et cetera. Well, then that is really, really good. So that's a really plus for me when I'm assessing my video game. Um, and, yeah, and also, yeah, the, you can read it. You can read the rest. Go on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, game con also, okay. So game context. Yeah. yeah, so game context, how you play the game. So it's not the story itself, but it's like how you play it. So in Pascal's case, Never Alone, uh, you know, there's a Fox character, a Nuna character. You can play the game alone and control both characters, or you can play two players where one would play the Fox, one would play Nuna, and then they would cooperate. Yeah. So the context upon which you're playing the game is really important. Even in my game, Portal, it's a one player game. I get them to go in groups and I actually get them to sort of participate. So one would play if they're struggling, the others would watch, they would say, oh, try this. This puzzle try to solve it this way or they would say i can't do this can you try so there's like a team element to it even if it's a one player game so you need to as teachers kind of think about how they're going to play the game and try to make it as more as collaborative as possible it's it's probably a, a better option um game structure uh, oh boy, 2D and 3D games. Uh, as you can see, Pascal's game was a 2D uh, left, right, up, down. That's the way mm -hmm. you can move. Uh, it's a lot simpler to control, um, but probably a tiny bit less immersive. Mm -hmm. 3D games is 360. It's a little bit harder to control, but very immersive. So if you're using a 3D game, keep in mind that some students might not be playing games. So you need to give some time for them to like acclimate. You might even have to show them how to yeah. play. Uh, so that would be interesting. Um, and finally, game mechanics. What is the control? How are you going to control the game? Keyboard, mouse, control pads, good old Nintendo control pad. My gosh, we're old. And or a touch pad. Uh, so that's the idea. Okay. Um, in order for you to evaluate this, we created a uh, it's in your guide, yeah. Yeah. but it's like a questionnaire. So as you're playing the game, we literally cover the five dimensions ourselves and ask yeah. you to just think about this. Yeah. Uh, so you can take a look at that. Um, and finally, the last thing is discussion questions, super important. We can't emphasize this enough. You really need to develop discussion questions. So you force them to experience the game the way you want them to. You're kind of like the guide. Yeah, you force them to pay attention so that they don't play it too fast and try to just finish it without thinking. Okay, so create discussion questions. We can give you samples of our discussion questions for a portal, for instance, just to show you what we did. Um, and that's it. I mean, Q and A. Uh, I just wanted to show you very briefly uh, oh, yeah. what it looked like in the classroom. Uh, if we can actually uh, show it to you, it's 15 seconds. But like, I asked students to just purchase the game. I gave them instructions. I walked them through it. I took an hour to explain it. And then I said, come bring your laptops to the next class. And they brought their laptops. And I actually brought my own computers as well and allowed them to play on my own computers as well. So I did some setup in the class. It wasn't too complicated. Um, but here's what it looked like. Right, so you see the setup, right? There's several TVs out there. Uh, you can bring your own TV, you can do what you want. It's not that complicated. Get IT to help you if you have struggles. That's it. Okay, we're done. Um, for those who need to go, you can go. You're fine. You're not late for class. But uh, we can stay for Q&A if you want to stay yeah. longer. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Pascal and John Nathan, for this very lively, informative, original, and inspiring presentation. It was very interesting. We, I have a few questions for you. Okay. First, Andrea, hi. Thank you for your great presentation. 
I think you answered that, but I want to be sure. Uh, did you use the games as homework or students played in class? Okay, so uh, we used it to, for students, they, they actually played in class. Uh, in my situation, the game was a little longer, so they played two hours in class. If they didn't get to the point where I wanted them to get, I would say continue it at home because they've purchased the game. If they don't have a means, then I would actually invite them to my office hours and they would play on my system, like my laptop. It was fine, you know, um, until they get to a point where I wanted them to get. Uh, in Pascal's case, go ahead. Uh, me, me, they only played in class. So they played in class and I didn't have them play the full video game. Like I think in yeah. two, three uh, uh, episodes, the third one, they got the idea of what uh, what I was trying to reach as an objective, but they could they could finish it if they wanted to at home. But we did it in class. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a, a question from uh, Raphael Thibault. Is there a research group we can join so we can help participate in this research in the future? I'm looking at my <laughs> network in college teaching. Do you know of any active groups of people talking about this subject? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, Raphael, again, it helps a lot. Okay, um, sorry, I, I didn't get the whole question, but Raphael, if you have some time, um, maybe I can share my email address in the chat and uh, just write to me. Um, I, I'm like, there are a few people that are interested in the research aspects of video game. We do not meet, though, unfortunately. I would love if we were to meet. But um, if you want, we can organize meetings and then grab more people as we go along. Because uh, there, I, I can give you some names again, but we don't regularly meet. We're just doing research in our own kind of isolated corners, you know. Uh, so just write to me. Uh, I think you have my email, Nicole, right? Uh, Pardon me? Nicole, you have my email. You yes. can you give it to uh, Raphael? Yeah. Okay. So give it to Raphael and anyone else who wants it, um, and it just contact me. It's okay. a great question. Yes. Uh, I'll okay. type it in the chat. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I can send it to Raphael. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other question to from uh, Karen Albert Landry. Do you find some on every uh, topic, or do you ever consider customizing, creating one? <laughs> That's such a good question. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, you can take it, Pascal, or uh, take, no, take it. I'm going to show them something. Okay. No, so we, we just it. took out uh, a bunch of books just, I think, a week ago on game design. So we don't have mm -hmm. any experience designing games. Forget it. Like, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, we are we are kind of that's kind of the direction we want to create yeah. something that's more customizable for us. However, it really is like think about it. Forget the video game. Think about it as a movie. Okay, so you find there are movies all over the place, right? You can find a movie in your literature course that has certain themes like the Victorian period or whatever, love or whatever. And you watch and you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then you bring it into class and you mold the experience. And in that way, you know, I think. It, you could probably find games for almost any subject. Um, it just might be games that you might not be comfortable playing. They might be too complicated, or it might be VR. For instance, even lab, like just testing lab work, there's something called Labster, where you're manipulating instruments in the lab and practicing how to do tests, right? All those are kind of gamified experiences. So we haven't found we haven't found a discipline that we can't find games. We only found disciplines where, or teachers yeah. where they're not flexible enough or they're not comfortable enough to use the game to mold yeah. it to their perspective or their objective. You will not find perfect games. So I must say, like, don't expect to find something that fits 100% yeah. for what exactly you want. Yeah. Not gonna happen. You really need to be kind of more open-minded to mold it. Uh, so the next step is to create your own game. Yeah, that would be great. That would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. thank you again, Pascal and Jonathan. It was very, very interesting. It was sympathetic. It was uh, inspiring. Uh, I hope I will have the opportunity to exchange it with you uh, another time. Well, thank you, oui. Oui. Thank, you. Oui. thank you for we, having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Question, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, oui, oui. Nous, on peut rester là. We can stay, on peut rester. Yeah, we can stay. We, we want questions. Je suis intéressée à savoir ce que vous avez trouvé comme ressources. Je suis présentement en train de rédiger mon essai sur la ludification de l'enseignement de la fiscalité. Une question très large. Oui. OK. OK. Pascal, do you want to take that? Ludification de quoi? Dans le domaine de la fiscalité. Fiscalité. OK. Ben, yeah. What's fiscality? Oui. 
Fiscal year is a is tax budget. Uh, yeah. Okay. In, income taxes and stuff. Wait. Well, that that exists, uh, Jonathan. Right? We had it. Yes. Picture, remember, we tried to find uh, video games and stuff. It exists. We y en a. We y en a sur uh, sur ça au fait. Uh, y en a y en a yeah. plusieurs. Wait. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm going to yeah. suggest is, and again, it's a little bit of a plug, but it's not really like, I'm not trying to steal Occupy's Thunder. I think you guys are doing great, but something's coming up next week that might be really interesting for you. And I'm going to post a link. It's from Egyptive. It's a lab uh, where we're talking about Egyptification um, and we're going to be presenting the guide in more details. And we're going to kind of try to do a workshop, but it's not just us, it's other people as well that are getting involved um, for, uh, gaming yeah. and that they're like we have a fashion program so we found a game where you open a company and you have to create a budget for it mm -hmm. and so on it's not detailed like to the point of college level but it, the basic concepts are there right you need a budget you need income coming in you need to invest so you can grow your market and so on uh, there are tons of games like that um and they present a really nice graphical interface i can give you a, a list of the one that we recommended for one teacher if you want something even more profound at a university level don't expect any graphics but it's very like um yeah. uh, graph based um, and that could be really interesting as well. So but, uh, it would be interesting yeah. that ce serait intéressant que vous veniez à cette uh, présentation déductive parce que c'est vraiment uh, tous des enseignants qui vont se réunir puis vont essayer de discuter puis de voir quel mm -hmm. quel jeu vidéo serait pertinent pour leur cours puis il va avoir une grande uh, discussion sur ça quel quel objectif pédagogique ils veulent uh, oui. qu'ils veulent atteindre uh, en relation avec uh, avec euh, euh, un jeu vidéo puis tout ça fait que ça va être comme un, 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 une plénière qui va se faire puis ça va être la première étape et après ça ces enseignants là ils vont aller euh, chercher un jeu vidéo puis tout ça puis ils vont revenir euh, à une deuxième étape euh, lors de l'éducation fait que ça ça peut être intéressant une belle avenue pour vous euh, oui, si vous mis le lien dans le chat là, euh, oui. Okay. Hop, oui, oui. Ça. merci <rire> oui Yes, okay. So this one's a big one. Um, uh, I didn't hear Pascal? the question. Okay, what go on. Go on. Go, what was the question, Jonathan? I didn't hear there. Oh, it's are there is there any advice to implement? So when you're when you're doing like when you're setting up your TV and all that stuff, you know, like what advice can we offer him? So you know what? You should take it and then I'll suggest something because well, you're not yeah. like huge in tech. Yeah, and you still so much, me, I didn't know anything about technology. So uh, the one thing I can say is, you know, just you know, have a technician on standby, <laughs> not too far to give you a hand on 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 this kind of stuff. Uh, have a plan B, so you know if you know because what we did is we put you know these they screen everywhere and had them play. But you know, I always have a plan B where they can download their video game if they want on their own, you know, and play it with their own portables. So you know, it's always you know foreseeing you know the some obstacles that may happen. But I've never seen where. You know, I was, you know, it didn't work out, you know, it always ends up working out. There are sometimes some, you know, you know, barriers, but you always overcome them because you kind of have foreseen it. So it's like always have like a plan B just in case one thing yeah. doesn't work and the other. And you know something I, I always say, you know, I always trust my students. My our students are way more uh, yeah. tech savvy than we are, you know, so, you know, putting your trust in them, instilling it and 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 asking them to to get the video game or to purchase it is 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 a, is a winning factor too. Once they have the video game, they can play it, you know. And I think that's the biggest obstacle is like when you're you're not tech savvy, it can be difficult. But after that, I mean, once you found your video game and you've played it, I mean, you know, there's no there's no limit, and you know what yeah. your learning objectives are. You know, it's kind of like a documentary in a sense, you know. Well, only if there's more to it. You know, the students become immersed in that game and they take way more out of it. You know. Yes. Yeah. So, but the, in terms of the implementation, I've got a few yeah. concrete sort of advice for you. 
One, um, so if we contact, you, uh, if I, you know, if we're in contact, I can give you the instruction sheet that I give for students to download the game. Yeah. And I actually demonstrate it in the class, okay, so that they can download it at home. Okay, so that's the first thing. Really have a clear instruction sheet and don't assume that they know. Some are savvy, some don't even know what Steam is, which is the game store. So, you know, have a good instruction sheet. That's the first step. The second step is, you know, uh, Pascal was right, have a plan B. So my plan B is always, I bring my laptop top if everything goes wrong at the very least i have my laptop and i can play in front of the class and show them what i want to show them okay uh, so always have a plan b that's really important i agree with that the second thing is if you can if it's possible contact a technician to kind of help you out to connect things so have very clear things like i need a tv i need an hdmi cable because you're going to connect it to the computer um, so have a list of things and I'll ask them to prepare it like a day before or an hour before your class, if that's what you have. If you don't have that, we don't have that. I actually get, um, get the stuff myself, the material myself, and uh, 30 minutes before the class, it's already mostly set up. I just have to roll everything in. So we have these yeah. chariots and stuff like that. Um, so uh, we've that's... even, um, I think we've even like set up the night before. And yeah, stuff sometimes and we said it works or not, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it gets easier. Like the first time, probably not so easy, but it does get easier. Um, you know, as you go on, you're like, okay, I know this. And also, you know, your old laptops, don't get rid of them. Keep them, keep them. I'm <laughs> serious. Okay. Cause you can use them after for just the games, you know? So like I have like three laptops, but they're kind of old that I kind of bring to my class or even my switch. I bring my switch sometimes portal is on switch now. So like, you know, just don't be afraid to sort of, uh, use as much resources and yeah. And I think students are really understanding. So don't worry too much if it doesn't work out. Uh, as long as you have that laptop that you can show in front of the class, you can yeah. get them through it, you know, that yeah. way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The, 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 I didn't uh, receive the guide, so uh, the guide, so please verify, uh, Jonathan, the, 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 I will write oh. to you and send you my real address. I did, the, the, I did not okay. uh, receive the guide. Okay. Mais il y a Anne-Marie qui a une dernière question. Anne-Marie, on peut-tu la laisser? Non? Okay. <rire> Juste Anne-Marie. Anne oui, je, je voulais la laisser parler, mais euh, je ne sais pas si elle peut parler. Oh, elle a levé sa main. Okay. Ah, elle a enlevé sa main. OK. Ah, Parfait. Ah, bon, c'est bon. OK, désolé. Je ne pense pas qu'elle puisse être. OK. Alors, on se dit à bientôt. Merci, vous êtes généreux.